So thanks a lot for organizing this conference. As I'm learning a lot. Um, yeah, so, yeah, and thanks for the invitation to speak. So I want to talk about uh, maybe a more descriptive title, uh, local Langlands as geometric Langlands. Uh, on the far from 10 curve. <clears throat> so, uh, so what's the context? Um, so Jared Wines, I was some uh, uh, setting us up for this. Um, so what, what Jared kind of explained is that, uh, that there is this notion of periodic Stukas. <clears throat> and uh, uh, well, one thing they explained is that uh, these things, they can be reinterpreted. As modifications. of vector bundles on the curve. The curve in my talk is always the fact from 10 curve. Um, and the other thing he hinted at is that, uh, which is some, uh, just follows the general kind of Langlands philosophy, uh, that you should be able to realize Langlands correspondence in the moduli spaces of her, in certain moduli spaces, and some of the function field cases are moduli spaces of Stukas. And so that down that you have periodic Stukas, you would of course expect that moduli spaces of periodic Stukas uh, should realize in the cohomology uh, the local Langlands correspondence. And when I was in Berkeley in 2014, there was an MSRI trimester where there was a number theory program and a geometric Langlands program. <coughs> and at, at the time, the communities were still rather disjoint. Um, and uh, there I gave a course where I kind of ex, ex, yeah, explained roughly some of what was also in, in, in Jared's talks. But then before I get this, Ingenious realization that uh, if you really reflect on what this means, these two things together, um, some of the periodic Stukas are just a different way of talking about vector bundles or, or G bundles uh, uh, on the curve, then this should somehow mean that G bundles on the curve, they should realize uh, the local Langlands correspondence. in some sense. Local Langlands correspondence. <coughs> and, well, I mean, so you should definitely look at something like the moduli space of G-bundles and so on, but then you're suddenly more or less saying the same words as you say in geometric Langlands, where they also have a curve and they also talk about moduli space of G-bundles. And so then you can just try to look at those papers and just translate them word by word, and uh, so that's what we've done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then somehow see how it relates to I mean, I guess we had some other motivations that you really thought this should be a good thing to do. But, yeah. um, I mean, I must admit that when Fark first mentioned this over coffee breaks, that once you do geometric Langlands on the Fark front tank, I was like, what? No. <laughs> then I reflected on this and actually, yes, it's a good idea. <laughs> um, and uh, a good idea I learned from Arthur's talk is to spend the rest of my talk setting up notation. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, 
So let me set up some notation. So, uh, so there is a non-Archimedean local field. So everything works for any non-Archimedean local field. Um, but I find it more concrete to really just fix QP throughout. You don't use much in generality anyways. And uh, yeah. Uh. <coughs> um, right, so, uh, so I guess by gamma I will denote the absolute gamma group. QP. Uh, I mean, some, sometimes I might call it gamma QP, but often just gamma. And this contains the V group of QP as usual. Uh, what else? Um, uh, yeah, right. So then the, uh, fix any connected reductive group G. Um, I will at some point fix and prime L different from P. And then we will somehow look at l adic representations. Uh, and uh, the final piece of data I might uh, fix is a FP bar and algebraic closure of FP. And then we had this field that also appeared in Jared's talks. It's usually called QP breve, which is the completion of the maximum unramified extension of a QP. <coughs> and then using this, you get to set B of G of Kotwitz. Uh, one way to think about this is that it's QP derive modulo si sigma conjugation. So as in Jared's talk, uh, the Frobenius on this is for some reason called sigma. Um, and it turns out that upper, I mean, upper is this, it looks like a huge uncountable set, but actually it's a countable set that you can describe very explicitly in a combinatorial way, and then we'll come back to this. Uh, I guess pi one of G will be pi one of G of your QP bar. Uh, is a Borovoi fundamental group. And when I talk about X law stuff, T, I really mean T by QP bar, where is there some kind of universal cartoon? In particular, uh, like it has a gamma in there. <coughs> and it also has, it has a dominant part. Okay. okay, sorry. <laughs> Back to topic. So, uh, okay, so recall from Jared's talks that um, whenever we have a, uh, uh, say it's a perfectoid space, for simplicity, let me say a phenoid um, in characteristic P. So by the way, in characteristic P, uh, well, there was this very strange notion of being perfectoid. This really just means that it's, there was this condition of being Tate, uh, that is some, uh, for example, just a Banach algebra over a non-comedian field would be Tate. And if you're in characteristic P, then the only extra thing you have to ask is that this Frobenius is an isomorphism. There's, there's nothing else. Um, okay, so then uh, associated to this you have this thing that was called script ys, uh, let me just call it a straight ys in my talk. Um, one and can so because it's state there, there is some is a topologically nilpotent unit in here, and <coughs> this condition here is somewhat independent of the choice. Um, and then there is a, there's this Frobenius acting on this, and then uh, X as, so this acts properly discontinuously, and so you can really just take the quotient and get some nice object. And so, uh, usually from a tidy bit, this will actually always be, I will always want to work over an algebraic closed space field, so this FP bar, that's why I chose it in the beginning. And so then this here, this would be an attic space over this maximum ramified extension. QP breve. But because you take the quotient by Frobenius here, 
this is really just an attic space uh, over QP. Right, and so, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Let me recall that uh, this was somewhat implicit in, in Jared's talks. Uh, if you say have any, for example, attic space, so something like a rigid space or something like this, uh, Z, <clears throat> and I will assume that everything I'm doing some is at least living over the periodic number, so it's at least over ZP, um, you get a sheaf of, and as Jared said, the good topology to put on perfectoid spaces is this is V topology, so you get a V sheaf um, called Z diamond, um, <coughs> which is functor from the perfectoid spaces of FP, uh, contravariant to sets, and takes any test space S to uh, the set of untilts. Of S. So saying that it's an untilled of S really means that it's, well, it's a perfectoid space together with an identification of its tilt with S. Um, it's an untilled of S plus a map from the untilled to Z. So with some like to say it's a map from, from your test object S to Z, but this S lives in characteristic P, but this could live in mixed characteristic. Uh, and so to map it, you first of all have to somehow specify a more flexible uh, structure sheaf on it, which might be of characteristic zero, and then you can specify a map. And then, as Jared was discussing, even the functor reality of this uh, association here is not in itself obvious, but uh, follows from this tilting equivalence between perfectoid spaces and the different characteristics once you've fixed the base. And uh, it's also not quite clear that this will be some this kind of V sheaf, but it's also true. Um, and if Z is analytic, um, so this is, is always satisfied. Uh, well, this somehow means that you're on the generic fiber. So they, let me, so attic spaces, there are some rather general notion. And on the one hand, they contain schemes, which are in fact contain formal schemes. Uh, in there, and on the other hand, which is some a disjoint collection of things that contain the so-called analytic attic spaces. And examples of such would be something like rigid spaces, or some kind of generic fibers of formal schemes. And uh, the way you isolate them is on, on, on formal schemes, you have interesting topologically nilpotent elements usually, if you're not just a scheme. Um, but then when you pass to the generic fiber, you somehow invert some of these topologically nilpotent elements that you already had. Like here you might have FP, then you can signal it up to ZP, and then here you have QP. So here P is topologically nilpotent, and if you go to the generic fiber, you invert that. So some of the condition is that this is locally spa AA plus where A is Tate. Uh, so it contains a topological new potent unit. <clears throat> and so this is always satisfied for our perfectoid spaces as we uh, defined them. <clears throat> uh, if Z is analytic, uh, then this Z diamond is actually what I call the diamond. Uh, and so what is a diamond? A diamond, this is a quotient of a perfectoid space by a proital equivalence relation. Uh, 
And uh, we will see many examples of, uh, of this in a second. And, um, and maybe the first thing I should say is why this is actually true here for such an analytic thing. Um, and then yeah, you just give me one example, give you one example of this, or two. Um, <coughs> if Z is, say, the addict spectrum of QP, <coughs> then one way to think about QP, uh, this thing is, um, well, you could either write this as some of the quotient of passing to an algebraic closure and then modding out by, well, I called it gamma now, gamma QP. Um, and then Z diamond would actually be, if this is already, this is a perfectoid space here because CP is a, such a perfectoid field. Um, so this would be spa of CP diamond mod Scala group. <coughs> but if you're already uh, represented by perfectoid space in this diamond operation, it's precisely the thing of passing to the tilt. So spa of CP flat, this is now really an object in our test category. Uh, modulo uh, the scalar action. Um, uh, you could also write uh, in a different way, and this appeared in Jared's talk, Spark QP, it's just adjoining all the p power roots of unity. So this QP adjoin all p power roots of unity and then complete it. Um, this makes things slightly more explicit because you can actually describe the Galois group. Uh, completely, it's just CP cross. And uh, you can also describe the tilt. So the tilt of this perfectoid field here, it would just be the power series ring in this, in some new variable T, one over infinity uh, mod CP cross. <coughs> where this T here is epsilon minus one, where epsilon corresponds to the sequence one theta P, theta P squared. And so then, how does, how does an element gamma here act? It acts while gamma of t is one plus t to the gamma, you should show that this makes sense, minus one. <coughs> and so, it's reasonably explicit. And so similarly, let, let me do a second example. Uh, if you take, say, um, the A1, over, well, let me now ignore the base field. So let's start with the A1 over CP. So here I, expl I explain what happens if your some base field is not, not yet perfectoid. Now I kind of explain what happens if, like, if something geometric that's not yet perfectoid. So if I pass the diamond here, so one way to think about this is that, uh, <coughs> well, let me, let me do, the, do the GM. <coughs> Uh, so there's something one might call GM tilde. So CP, and then you mod out by uh, ZP, where GM tilde is the inverse limit over the piece power map on, on GM. <coughs> and so the piece power map is always a degree P, find the tar cover, with scholar group uh, Z mod P. And then if you, as it pass up this tower, uh, this over GM is a ZP cover. Or, I mean, you could keep, keep track of the tail twist, but I work over CP so I can just ignore this. Uh, and uh, this guy here is perfectoid as, as an analytic space. Precisely because you've now extracted enough uh, P power roots of, uh, of elements. And you can also describe what it's tilde is, and the tilde is just a similar thing uh, over the, uh, uh, the tilt of the field. And uh, then you well, still divide by ZP. And so again, you get a quotient of, of a perfectoid space non characteristic P by, by a proital equivalence relation. So, so most of these proital equivalence relations just arise by taking a quotient under a profinite group action.
Um, and so uh, let me discuss a little bit about uh, the properties of this um, of this uh, association that takes any addict space Z to this uh, Z diamond. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing is that in some sense it only remembers uh, so one thing it's supposed to remember is all the topological information. Uh, so like the underlying topological space, uh, right, maybe I should say that first. So, uh, the underlying topological space of Z is actually canonically as homeomorphic to the underlying topological space of this Z diamond, but I didn't really say what, how it defines this here for a V-sheet, but there's a can canonical definition of what the underlying topological space is and it turns out to recover the one for Z if Z is analytic. Um, if Z is not analytic, the situation is actually much more subtle, but what's very analyzed very, very precisely by Ian Gleason. Uh, he's here. You can ask him about this. It's quite interesting. Um, uh, the second I wanted to say is that if uh, Z to Z prime and yeah, also uh, Z, you can recover the etal side of Z from the etal side of the diamond. And there's this general philosophy of how you define etal maps of sheaves. It's just whenever you pull back to a representable thing, the pullback should be representable and represented by an etal map and so on. <clears throat> so these things are completely captured uh, by the diamond. Um, On the other hand, if you have a universal homeomorphism, uh, so some purely inseparable extensions, characteristic P, or just uh, I don't know, resolves as a, as a cusp to G2 and A1 or something like this, uh, then the induced map is an isomorphism. And, but, and maybe this, this last one is due to Kitlai and Mu. But I mean, you could also ask whether, I mean, how much data do you really lo you lose? So let, let's say you start with something like a class of rigid spaces where you somehow got rid of this ambiguity of the universal homeomorphism so that you might consider, say, normal rigid spaces. over QP, and there's a slightly more general class you might allow called semi-normal, but... Um, and, I mean, these go to diamonds, but diamonds together with a structure map to spark QP diamond, right? But just for, by functorality. Um, so X maps to... <clears throat> Let me just write QP diamond there. Um, and uh, this actually turns out to be fully faithful. And you could really use any, at least characteristic zero non archimedean base field here. Um, and, uh, right. Uh, so you can. On this class of things, you can really completely recover it if you remember how it sits over QP. So this is really justifying this, uh, this idea that in this diamond world, like see, saying how something lives over QP is somehow exactly the datum of saying how, uh, giving the structure map to spark QP diamond. And, but now you're suddenly in a world where something might have several structure morphisms to spark QP diamond, by, by, just by somehow specifying different untils. Uh, All right, so this is something I wanted to recall. And so, like in the beginning of Jared's talk, he somehow made the point that in some sense, when we define Stukas, we, will, we are interested in def defining some fiber product like S times spark QP. 
And now, this never made any good sense because this isn't characteristic P, this isn't characteristic zero, so this doesn't make sense. But now, once we've learned of this diamond operation, we can pass this thing here into characteristic P by passing to the diamond, which is some kind of, I mean, as you see from these formulas, some kind of generalization of tilting uh, to arbitrary eddic spaces. So this fiber product makes sense, and it lives, tautologically, it lives over spark GP diamond. <coughs> And so this philosophy should tell you that somehow there should be a distinguished untilled of this uh, corresponding to this structure morphism of diamonds. And this is precisely what this YS is, right? So this YS diamond turns out to be precisely this uh, fiber product here. Um, and this comes with this map to spark QP diamond and some, uh, this is really the thing that's incarnated by YS to spark QP diamond. And uh, if you think about what XS would be in the setting, XS diamond would be this funny thing where you take quotient first S by the Frobenius of S and then take a quotient of spark QP diamond. And again, this lives over spark QP diamond. And it's somehow incarnated by the Fagman time curve. And some of Stukas, there should be vector bundles on here, which are some of Frobenius equivariant, and so there should be vector bundles on this some, some approximation. And maybe also let me include this. So if uh, S sharp is an untilled of S, uh, we get, uh, well, S sharp so certainly. Uh, S sharp diamond, well, this is just equal to S. Um, uh, but it's, uh, giving you a map, to, well, some of the graph map uh, of this, uh, until they correspond to structure maps to here. And this is a map that's also, this whole map is over spark QP diamond. <coughs> and this is incarnated by uh, the Cartier divisor S sharp into YS. Or spark GP. <coughs> All right, so this is just recalling a little bit from Jared's talk. Um, uh, okay, so uh, from now on, I will actually work on perfectoid spaces, not just over FP, but on perfectoid spaces over FP bar. The reason is that if I would work over FP, then yeah, all of my spaces would live over FP and the Ital cohomology would still remember that FP itself has some Ital cohomology, but I want to get rid of this kind of cohomology that just comes from the base. And so I work over an algebraic closed space field to generally get rid of extra erroneous effects that would come just from the base field. <coughs> Okay. And so we were somehow led to just study the bun G, uh, the modular space of G bundles. Bun G is, uh, will actually be turned out to be a stack for the V topology. Uh, v stack that takes any uh, S, the perfectoid space of FP bar, to the G bundles on, on the Fark von Tent curve XS. Or this is with the, with the isomorphism, so he regards this as a groupoid. And again, there is something to prove about descent for the V topology, but let, let me not get into that. Um, uh, 
Well, how about this? Oh, whatever. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let me. So, today I mostly want to discuss the structure uh, of Bungie. Uh, oh, yeah, I wanted to make this. Uh, there's a slightly confusing point here. Is that there is not really one Fark von Ten curve. So usually, in, like when you do I don't know, geometric lengths or whatever, there is one curve that's fixed in the beginning, and then you look at modulus based of bundles on that curve. But here, there's not really one curve. Like for for any complete algebraic closed field C in characteristic P, Jared defined the Fark von Ten curve X C, and now more generally for any S, we have a Fark von Ten curve X S. But these are, I mean, they are some all incarnations in some sense of the same kind of idea, but there is not this one fixed curve that's there in the beginning. But really, the Fark von Ten curve, it depends on what your S is, and then for any F, you have the Fark von Ten curve. But still, it makes sense, even though there is not the Fark von Ten curve, it makes sense to talk about G bundles on the Fark von Ten curve, because, well, anyways, I mean, if you define a modular space of G bundles, you anyways already you need to specify what the S value points are, then you get your Fark von Ten curve XS for that, and then you talk about G bundles. So. I don't know. This was probably more confusing than helpful, but uh, anyways. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, if you want to understand some kind of space, uh, the first thing you should understand is what its uh, geometric points are. So let's do that. Um, so let's say S is some sparse C, where C uh, is some um, complete algebraic closed. Uh, non Archimedean field. Uh, so, FP long series T, completed algebraic closure or something like that. Um, and then uh, there's a theorem of the classification of G bundles uh, on the curve. So, this is due to Falk and Fontaine. Uh, for GLN, and then to FARC uh, for general G. And let me also mention uh, the work of Johannes Anschutz, who did this in the function field case. If you replace QP by FP long series T. <coughs> so this was an instance where the function field case turned out to be slightly harder than uh, the PLA case. Um, so as someone explained in Jared's talk, there is this natural map from the stack of, uh, from this set of G isocrystals to Bun G, to see all your points. Up to isomorphism, and that's a bijection. And it's really only a bijection, but okay. So in some both sides here are naturally groupoids, and they're not the same as groupoids, but if you pass to isomorphism classes, it's a bijection. Um, how does this go? Um, if you have some uh, element in here, and really let me take it represent it by an element in this QP breve, um, then you can send this to a bundle I will call EB. Um, and how do you get that? You take as a trivial G bundle over YS. And then you quotient by uh, the action of B times phi. Well, I guess it, this is more or less formula. Right, so, so, so to define a G torso, there are different, very different ways of thinking about a G, a G bundle, um, all of which are useful. So there is this, what we've most often seen, I think, in, in, in this summer school is that the Tanakian perspective is that the tensor, exact tensor functor from uh, the category of representations of G to the vector bundles on X. Um, but you can also think of this as just a, a G torsor on XS, so something that's acted on by G and it's locally somehow isomorphic to just G acting on itself. Uh, such as this, uh, yeah. And G's, I mean, here is this just a trivial G torsor over YS. And then, uh, but then you descend it via an automorphism, and this one makes it a non-trivial due to also, uh, yeah, on the base. But 
But I mean, for GLN, this is really the, the thing that Jared uh, defined. Can I ask this yeah. So can you also somehow define the entirely on the diamond, or you, do you really need the edit space? So. Yeah, no, you really need the edit space structure, right? Because um, <coughs> the diamond, it somehow, it, it forgot what the structure sheaf on this thing is. And like the zero of, uh, coherent sheaves of Gibbons and so on, this really requires you to know what the, the kind of coherent structure sheaf on this is. Uh, right. So in particular, uh, it follows that, again, I didn't really define this underlying topological space of something like this, but it's some more or less equivalence classes of geometric points. Uh, yeah. Super way. And uh, this is then just the underlying topological space is just a set B of G. <coughs> okay, so we understand. Uh, well, I mean, first, so far this is just a bijection of the, it will become a homeomorphism in just a second. Um, <coughs> So I already hinted that the set B of G was something you could really uh, explicitly understand and I will discuss this in a second for GL2 how it looks like. Uh, for now let me give you some of the abstract uh, nature of this description. So there are two invariants uh, that Kotwitz defined um, called nu and kappa. Uh, and so this is a Newton point. And this is a, well, often called the Kotwitz invariant or Kappa invariant. Um, <coughs> and the Newton point, this will be, so this is why I introduced this notation before. So you take the dominant core characters of T, actually the rational ones, and uh, actually the one you will get will be invariant under the Galois group. So that's the Newton point. Um, and then there is this extra invariant, which is an element in the fundamental group of G, the core invariants on the gamma. I mean, all I'm, if you, it's somehow fine if you assume that G is split and then you can forget about these decorations with gamma. But, okay. um, But I mean, the first thing to notice is that these are both countable sets. So this is the most countable set, and in practice, this gives you a really explicit combinatorial description. I mean, so you can describe the image of this map. And, yeah. um, and so, uh, to any point sum of bun G, I mean, if you, if you, yeah. you can associate an element in B of G, and then take its Newton or Kotlitz point, and then you can try to analyze uh, how, how how nu and kappa are variant families. And this is uh, analyzed in the following theorem. So this is uh, due to Gelaia Liu uh, regarding nu. It's due to, it's in my paper with Fark regarding kappa. And uh, Hansen did uh, part three for GLN and Eva Fiemann I did part three that I will um, write down in, in a second in general. Um, okay, so what are, what are the statements? So the, the first is that this map new is semi-continuous. Uh, so there is this natural dominance order you have on uh, co-characters. Um, and then let me not say lower or say upper because I'm always confused about signs. Uh, let me rather draw a picture in a second. Uh, what's slightly confusing is actually there's a similar theorem about families of isocrystals and where there's also, you can also define these invariants and there's also a semi-continuity theorem due to uh, Rappaport Richards. Uh, but it, there actually the semi-continuity goes the other way. Uh, so, but, okay. um, but here it's, it's, it's the same continuity you would somehow expect that somehow matches what happens more or less in usual. On a usual curve. Um, okay, the second theorem is a uh, part of the theorem is that this 
uh, kappa map is locally constant. And in fact, you can directly show that it actually describes the connected components of Bungie. So why is this kappa map the connected components are precisely described by this group theoretic invariant. <coughs> and then the last statement is that um, uh, one and two are, is all you can say really. So uh, Bungie is really homeomorphic to BG. Uh, when this is given some of the order topology, where new kappa is some of the specialization of new prime kappa prime, if new is less or equal to new prime in the dominance order, and the kappa should be equal, right? This should be locally constant. <coughs> It's actually very, very similar to, to vector bundles on P1, yeah? You just have more bundles as well. Let me discuss this now for GL2. Uh, sorry, uh, new. Sorry, I meant, I meant, as some uh, from the map from Bungie, which identified by the and then new to yeah, and similarly for two. It's, 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 yeah. Okay, so here's a picture for GL2. <coughs> so this is classifying the rank two vector bundles, and of course the, the, the obvious vec rank two vector bundle is just all squared. But then we also we knew that there is some aligned bundles, right? So for example, we have O of minus one plus O of one. And actually, just like on P1, it turns out that there is a kind of degeneration from O squared to O of one. So this is a, this here denotes a degeneration. <clears throat> and then you can degenerate further. You can go to O of minus two plus O of two. And you can keep going, right? So you have all the O of minus n plus O of n's in there. <clears throat> uh, something that you don't see uh, on, on a P1 is that there is also like there's one stable vector bundle for each rational slope. So there's one for O of a half. So this corresponds to the isocrystal. Uh, so this is the EB, where B is a matrix 0, 1, P0, uh, P inverse. <coughs> um, and turns out that this, uh, yeah, so maybe I should have first said that this kappa invariant in this case is just a degree. So pi one of g is just c, and gamma is x trivial because we have a split group. <coughs> and so this is one connected component. These are all the line bundles uh, of degree zero. So this is the degree zero component. These are all the rank two bundles of degree zero there. And they, in this case, they just form a chain of specializations. Uh, this is specific to GL2 that this is just a chain. In general, there would be some very complicated combinatorial uh, thing. Um, so this would degenerate to O plus O of one, which is also a rank two uh, bundle. And it can degenerate to O of minus one, so of two, and so on. And then, then it just somehow repeats. You can twist this whole thing by O of one, and then you get here O of one squared, specializing to O plus O of two. Uh, 
and so on. And so the length of the specializations they should actually indicate the co-dimension of points. So this is actually like a generic point, so co-dimension zero. This is a co-dimension two point, this is a co-dimension four point. This point is of co-dimension one, this is of co-dimension three, co-dimension five, and so on. No, I'm just saying there's something slightly confusing about this notation with these O of lambdas. They are not line bundles, yeah? So if you have an, for a rational number, in, like um, prim I mean, in, in simple terms, for a reduced fraction, like the denominator gives you the rank of the bundle. Uh, so this O of one half is really rank two bundle. Uh, which, yeah, so that's the notation that uh, that's become standard. It's slightly confusing uh, because you might expect that O of a half is really square root of O of one, but it isn't. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, you can't really have any fractional things down here because for a fractional thing, it would already be itself of rank two and then it would actually be one of these same stable points you have here. Right, uh, so, so uh, what are the co-characters? The dominant co-characters? Well, x lowest dot t is just c squared, and it, again, I can forget about the couple, right? Um, x lowest dot t, well, q would be q squared, and x lowest dot t, q plus, would be those pairs, lambda one, lambda two, such that lambda one is greater or equal to lambda two. <coughs> and then, uh, I mean, here, for example, the lambda is equal to a half, a half. Oh, it's a new, new is equal to a half a half. Here it's new is equal to zero zero. And then here new is some zero one zero. Here is two minus one. Does O one correspond to B or P or the inverse? Uh, P inverse. Uh, yeah, don't ask me. Maybe I'd redefine my kappa to be minus kappa in the usual normalization. Uh, I don't give any guarantees that the signs are completely correct in this in our paper. Okay. Um, okay, so this would be the degree one component. This is the degree two component. Right, and so some of this is what you some of what the horizontal information you're supposed to convey, and of course it continues in both ways. Um, the vertical information is supposed to be the co-dimension, right? So this is the co-dimension zero strata. This is the co-dimension one. These are the co-dimension two strata. And so. O minus one plus O of two, it's three. Okay, yeah, I suppose try to draw this somewhat equally spaced and this reflects the geometry. There's a, There's a gap of two between any further of these specializations, yeah. So the only like immediate specialization of quad dimension one is the one here. That's right, exactly right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So in general, the code I mentioned uh, of this uh, stratum bun GB, I will come to this in a second, is actually uh, two row paired with a new of B. Yeah, so actually that bungee is of, itself is of dimension zero, it turns out. Um, but, uh, yeah. So this is, this is really called a, this is dimension zero stratum. This is a dimension minus one, dimension minus two stratum. But I think it's actually more confusing in language than first talking about co-dimensions. <laughs> um, uh, so each connected component, uh, this is something you see in this picture, and that this is actually something that does generalize. Each connected component
has a unique semi-stable point. Uh, so same as the point sum of one, which doesn't somehow canonically reduce to, to a parabolic. So some of these, this is a direct sum of line bonds of different slopes, and this somehow canonically reduces to a parabolic subgroup. Um, but these really, they, these are the ones that are genuinely new somehow in some sense for, for the group G. I mean, in general, they're, they're indexed by this pi one of G in lower gamma, which here for GL2 is Z. Yeah. Um, it has a unique same as double component uh, point. And this actually corresponds to the elements in B of G, which are what Kotwitz termed basic. Um, and so there is a sum of this bijection between the basic elements in B of G. So basic for GLN would somehow mean isoclinic, just one slope. Uh, and uh, this maps actually isomorphically uh, Y is a co copper invariant too. So this is pi one of G gamma. And then you can somehow, like also classically somehow, the first thing you really try to understand maybe about the stack of G bundles is the this same as stable locus. So this SS stands for same as stable. Uh, so this is an open substack of bun G. And this is something that you can now completely explicitly describe This is maybe the first thing where we really now see the relation to representation theory uh, emerging. I mean, so far, this picture is extremely similar uh, to the vector bundles on P1. But if you were in P1, then say the automorphisms uh, of this O squared, they would be the algebraic group GL2. Um, but now something completely different happens here. Uh, is that it's, you don't see the algebraic groups appearing, but you see the locally profitable the periodic groups appearing. So it's a disjoint union over all the B and B of G basic, which I recall goes by a kappa just to this fundamental group of G, covariance under gamma. Um, of, oh, let me first say that. So it's, first of all, this disjoint union, this we already know, but each stratum bun GB, it's actually just a classifying space for a locally profinite group. So this thing here is the automorphisms of this bundle EB. And uh, let me just point out that if B is equal to one, so someone we're looking at the trivial G bundle, then this GB is just equal to G. And so this bun G1, so the locus of trivial G bundle somewhere, is a classifying space for our periodic groups that we're interested in. So what is this GB here? Uh, one way to say what this algebraic group GB actually is, is that if you base change it to your curve, like over the curve you have some of the automorphism group scheme over XS of this EB. So this is an inner form of G over XS. And <coughs> in the case where where B is basic, it turns out that this inner form actually canonically descends down to QP and comes from an algebraic group, which is an inner form of G. This GB is an inner form of G. Uh, did this discussion of like extended pure inner forms happen at this school yet? Yeah, it's one of these extended pure inner forms that were already discussed um, uh, that you get here. Uh, but so, so this, if you take the automorphic group over the curve, you still get something that's, that's some kind of algebraic group. But then if you take the global sections of this thing over the curve, you end up, because the global sections of the structure chief are just QP, you just end up with the QP points.
I guess let's see. Continuous maps from S into this thing. Uh, yes, this is the very next thing I want to say. Uh, but bef let me just note one particular consequence for us is that uh, this means that one way to now think about the representation theory of this group GB of QP, like just in the way the chiefs work on like classifying stacks, like, like chiefs on a classifying stack for a group, they are just representations of the group. Uh, whatever notion of representation and whatever notion of chief you write have, uh, have here, there, there should be some equation like that. And let me not try to make precise right now which representations I mean here and which chiefs I mean here. Uh, and then just by uh, some extending by zero or something like this, you can take a sheaf on a, so this sheaf's on, on the stratum bun GB. And then, I don't know, by extending by zero or something like this on sheaves, you can embed this into the theory of sheaves on bun G. So now we've embedded the representation theory we care about into the theory of sheaves on bun G. Okay, and so of course we would also like to understand the other components. So general B. So there, <coughs> there the situation is a bit more interesting. Um, so you, I mean, it still follows from this general semi-continuity results and so on that um, this is a locally closed uh, sub-stack. And <coughs> again, this only has one geometric point. And so I mean, slightly more precisely, it's really, again, a classifying stack for a group. So it's point modulo some group that I call fancy JB. Uh, um, so it's some of the automorphisms of this EB again. Uh, <coughs> but now the thing that uh, was mentioned in Jared's talks is that some of for, for non uh, same as stable bundles, like the automorphisms, they are much wilder. Uh, this comes into play. Um, so what is the structure uh, of this thing there? Uh, it sits in an exact sequence where there's some connected group. Uh, in a suitable sense, it's uh, unipotent. Uh, so it's, it behaves like a unipotent algebraic group, roughly. Uh, I will uh, make this more precise in a second. <coughs> and then it projects onto its connected components, and the connected components actually are uh, the automorphisms of the isocrystal. So these are the automorphisms. Of B somehow, uh, on this, on this. Uh, sigma centralizer of B. So this GB uh, will be an inner form of a levy. G, at least if G is quasi split. Yeah, all these things, they are, they are, they are groups on this perf over FP bar, sheaves of groups. And so this is an exact sequence of sheaves of groups. on this test category that I'm always using. Um, let me just, um, before I, uh, I make this more precise in the case of GL2 again, um, <coughs> uh, let me just note that uh, because it is somewhat connected or even unipotent, um, this cannot act non-trivially on sheaves. At least on some more allied sheaves. Um, 
And so you see that as re regarding sheaves, remember this part doesn't actually, you cannot act, so the representations here are the same as the representations there. And you see that, again, the representations of uh, this periodic group, they are the sheaves on, I mean, so tautologically in a sense, they are the sheaves on this quotient stack. Um, but then because this unipotent part cannot act, they are also the sheaves on this uh, more fancy classifying stack, which is the stratum of Bungi. And so again, this sits uh, y extension by zero inside of all sheaves on Bungi. <clears throat> and so this would mean that for any kind of reasonable sheaf theory on Bungi, you would expect that the sheaves on Bungi, they are glued uh, from all the sheaves on all the strata, and all, on all the strata you have a purely representation theoretic description. This means yeah, the sheaf theory on this stack is more or less completely described in terms of representation theory. So the only genuine geometry in a sense is when you glue different strata, and then you might ask whether this admits a purely representation theoretic description, and this is something I actually don't know. No, don't know. So, so far I really think there is some kind of non-trivial geometry involved in how these different strata speak to each other. Exactly, yeah. Right, so, I mean, to somehow just fully describe this category, but somehow have to describe the strata and, like, these kind of, R, take an RJ law star from one stratum, then pull back to another stratum, you would have to describe these functors. And, but these seem quite hard to, to describe, actually. I mean, some examples you can do it, like, for example, for this, so for this one, you can actually do the computation, and maybe also for this one or something, as a master student looking at this, but it quickly becomes quite subtle. I think. Um, yeah, so let me let me give an example again for GL2. After some point, this, this levy stops degenerating, right? So hmm? after some point, this levy stops degenerating. You get the same levy. You get the same levy, yeah. Do you know there what the extension? No, like no, like even even for GL2, as you somehow you always have the same. You, you somehow always get just sheaves of the torus. Uh, I mean, representation of the torus. But they, I still don't know how these are all glued together. Um, I mean, I didn't look all too hard into it. I mean, there might be a way to describe it. I mean, I think it's worth looking at, but I don't know. Yeah. And I think something non trivial must be happening. Um, uh, right, I wanted to give an example. Uh, so let's consider uh, this P, which corresponds to some of P inverse 1. So this corresponds to O plus O, O of 1 plus O. And then the automorphisms of this EB, so the automorphisms of O of 1 plus O. Uh, well, this is, these are matrices, right? So, uh, where, uh, so there are actually no maps from O of 1 to O because there's some uh, a higher degrees than this. Um, so this is actually, you get a zero here in the lower corner. Um, the automorphisms of O1, well, that's the same as the automorphisms of O, that's just QP cross, and for some reason I always underline these things. Um, <coughs> and, uh, but then there is this upper triangular thing, uh, and this is exactly the space of global sections of O of 1. Right? And so here this this and this will somehow always be the case somehow. This diagonal part, this is this uh, JB of QP in this case. So in here JB would just be a GM squared or, or the torus of your your group. Um, but then you get this this part here, and this is this uh, GB circ. So, I mean, if you would imagine something similar for GLN, then you would have some kind of, I mean, if you, it's really line bundling, it would get the diagonal part is the JB, and then there's this whole uh, upper triangular part, which gives you this, what I call this unipotent part. And really, it looks unipotent here already because it's somewhat upper triangular. Um, 
<coughs> and uh, I mean, Jared was describing this, uh, that these global sections of O of 1, uh, they are really a perfectoid open unit disk. Um, so this is some, uh, uh, more precisely, like the R-valued points would be all the elements of R which are close to one, radius less than one, uh, less than one, and uh, here X would go to the logarithm of the Teichmüller lift of X, which gives you a global section here. <coughs> Okay, and so an open unit is that some, uh, I mean, you think of this as some kind of contractible space, basically. Uh, and so, yeah, in particular, it's connected, and so it, it cannot somehow act on, on some kind of series of LIX sheets or something like that. Right, and yeah, so, uh, boop, boop, boop. I mean, this is somehow answering this question that, uh, um, that uh, uh, Suk Vushin uh, asked previously. So you can, can define the dimension of this automorphism group. And the way dimensions are defined is somehow really is kind of the algebraic or some of the dimensions, which are not just some profinite sets, but really, Something like an actual unit disk or something. Like this. this is a, the relevant notion of dimension here. And so this locally profile stuff this wouldn't count anything towards the dimension. It's just uh, of this connected part. And this would be uh, two row paired with nu of b. <coughs> and so then the way dimensions of classifying stacks work, then this means the dimension of the classifying stack would be minus this. And um, yeah, there was also this dimension, uh, this question of the dimension of Ban G itself. And so he's going to somehow show that Ban G is in a suitable sense that we define, it's a kind of smooth art stack of dimension zero. And these strata, they would also be smooth art stacks. And say some of negative dimension. <coughs> but I don't really want to go into how, how we define this notion of art in stacks in our setting and what smoothness means and so on. It's, 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 it's a long story. I, mean, I must say that back in 2014, when we, when Fark first proposed this idea of doing geometric Langlands uh, on the Fark von Ten curves, it seemed like a completely daunting and impossible task because you were living in a world of geometry where nothing was really making any sense at all. Uh, I mean, usually when you do geometry, you want some kind of finite type schemes or maybe finite, uh, some rigid spaces or something like this. But here we were in a world where everything was a at best a perfectoid space, but really a quotient of a perfectoid space by a protal equivalence relation. And then you were just naively expecting that all these notions of LX sheaves and so on, they will just magically adapt to the setting and everything works. And uh, well, it can be made to work, but it was a bit of work. Okay. <coughs> uh, right. Uh, I have 10 minutes left, I guess. Is that right? Um, so in the remaining 10 minutes, let me maybe say a few words, a few more words about um, this kind of unipotent stuff that appeared here. So something like these global sections here. So these are an example of what's known as a banach colmes space. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about them. Um, so may maybe let me uh, start with a Uh, 
with a uh, sort of with a definition of what these things are, just to uh, get some kind of focus. Um, uh, so let me again fix a C, and actually this time actually over QP. Uh, it's not a really a relevant choice, but um, that's how the, the things are traditionally phrased. So let, let me do that. Um, and then uh, actually we work now on perfectoid spaces over the tilt of C. Okay. The category of Bonner Colmes. So this basically goes, this definition is basically due to Colmes. Um, in the precise form I'm stating it now, uh, it's in the thesis of Artius de um, uh, uh, is a subcategory uh, of sheaves of GP vector spaces. And generated uh, by two things. Uh, one is just QP itself, uh, and the other one is you take the affine line over over C and pass to the corresponding diamond. Uh, under direct sums and extensions. Um, the other log quotients. So you do some kind of finitary operations, just starting from those two sheaves, and all the sheaves you can build in this way, they are in, in this category of Banach miss spaces. Um, and so if you, so the, the first incarnation you really see of the Banach miss space is what its global sections are. And so the global sections are, uh, in the first case, they are QP, and the other one, they are, they are C, right? So global sections here, just C. So there are some, uh, the global sections of such a Banach Kormes space, there are, are some kind of Banach QP vector space. So actually, these things always carry some kind of canonical Banach structure. Um, there are some Banach vector spaces that are built from finite dimensional vec QP vector spaces and finite dimensional C vector spaces. And they are allowed to be combined in funny ways. <coughs> And so, as QP vector space itself, these things are uncountably dimensional usually because C is uncountably dimensional over QP. But some, uh, there's still some finite dimensionality to them because they are somehow built from finite dimensional QP and finite dimensional C vector spaces. Here's a proposition that if E is any coherent sheaf, so actually on this curve XC itself, it turns out this is more or less Neusserian. And so you can talk about coherent sheaves there without much trouble. Um, so you can even talk about like torsion sheaves there. Um, <coughs> uh, you can do two things. Uh, the functor that takes any S to H0 of XS of some E restricted to XS, or S mapping to the H of one. Uh, these are Banach Kolmes spaces. And then uh, theorem of Lebras is actually that there exists a derived equivalence between the derived category of coherent sheaves on the 5.10 curve and the bounded derived category of Banach Kolmes spaces. 
that's somehow realized by this global sections factor. <clears throat> so in this sense, this theory of banach kolmel spaces, this actually appeared before the Falk van curve was around. Um, and was used uh, originally for similar purposes within uh, abstract Peter Koch theory. Uh, so to prove that weakly admissible implies admissible and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and it turns out that this is in some sense just an equivalent way of talking about the Falk van curve, which was, it turns out that the Falk van Ten curve has such a rich geometry that a coherent shape is somehow completely determined by what its global sections are, which is something that's not at all true like in usual well, geometry. Uh, so let me give some examples of this and then stop. The higher HI is vanishing, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a curve in this coherent cohomology somehow, yeah. Mm. But yeah, it's a good point. I mean, Lebrun also describes how the T structures match up. It means it's, it's not T exact just because you somehow have it once, but you can describe when this happens and so on. Um, so it's an <laughs> another instance of tilting, but no tilting in this kind of derived category sense. Um, uh, right, so some examples. Uh, some C or spa C itself embeds into XC. Into I take the I lower star of, 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 of C. Uh, this is a coherent sheaf on, on XC. <coughs> and if I take the global sections of this, I mean, if I base change this to OS, then some of the base change, I mean, so XS for any S over this, uh, then this, the base change would just be the corresponding until S sharp into S. And then this would be the global sections on S sharp. And so this would just be, yeah, if someone take the global sections on S sharp. And so this is represented precisely by the A1 S sharp uh, well, diamond, I guess. So this is, oh, sorry, C, over C. So this is precisely the one, one of the two sheets we allowed. Um, another sheaf uh, we can take is just a structure sheaf. And then, I mean, the global sections of this are just QP, and more generally, for any, for any S, the global sections of, of O are QP underline of S. I never defines this. So this is just a continuous map from the underlying topological space into QP. <coughs> and so this gives us this other sheaf. Okay, so these were allowed by definition. Let's do two more examples. Um, if you have, or maybe three, but I'm already running out of time. Um, uh, for O of one, as in Jared's talk, there's some of this element T uh, log epsilon that gives us a map from O to O of one. Uh, and then the quotient is actually precisely this Cartier divisor uh, we had up there. So we get this shorter text sequence. <clears throat> and then actually in these two first two cases, it turns out that there is no H1. And so if you look at the long text sequence here, you see that zero maps to QP, maps to this H naught of O of one, maps to a1c diamond to zero. So you have this ex extension of a1 uh, by qp. And you can actually identify this with here uh, with yeah, a perfectoid unit disk, as I said. And then this map is actually sending x to the logarithm. So this is basically the logarithm up here in that incarnation. <coughs> And then the kernel of the logarithm somewhere on the universal cover, it's the uh, compatible choices of p power roots of unity. Oops.
So let's quickly do one example where uh, actually an H1 appears. So O of minus one, that's anti-ample somehow, so it shouldn't have any global sections. But you can still analyze it by a similar exact sequence. So just by twisting this by O of minus one. Um, this doesn't actually change this. The line bundle becomes trivial here. Uh, and so you see that uh, zero maps to uh, the global sections here we said are QP. The global sections here we said uh, is a, uh, A1. And of course, I mean, QP maps into A1. Uh, so uh, yeah, sorry, I should. Uh, let me write the zero here to make it less confusing. Uh, for better pattern, ma pattern matching. And then we get this h1 of o of minus one here to zero. So we see that this banach comet space here is the A1 diamond modulo QP. So this is also something you can do. You can take the quotient of A1 by this QP. And so this is also like a diamond in our world, right? So it's also, this was a diamond, and we take a further quotient by a protal equivalent simulation. That's still allowed even though it looks a bit funny. Um, and all right, I'm already out of time, but let me just quick, very quickly uh, give one further example. Um, you can also take O modulo T squared, so to say. So um, this is an extension between I lower star C and I lower star C. So some of this is a completed local ring at, at this cut the divisor would somehow be a complete DVR, and then I can somehow mod this DVR by the, the, the second the square of the uniformizer. And then this gives rise to an extension between A1 and then this H naught of this O mod T squared and A1. <coughs> and so, he, and this is actually non, highly non-split. And because this extension is highly non-split, it's coherent sheaves. And we said it's some kind of equivalence. So you get this non-split extension of just the usual rigid space of an affine line over C by the affine line over C, but this is kind of kind of weird guy, which is just a diamond. So this is not a rigid space. Even though it's somehow just an extension of a rigid space by a rigid space, it still has some highly non-trivial structure. And so, <clears throat> yeah, so the these automorphism groups, these connected parts of these automorphism groups, they are somehow built from such banach comet space that are actually associated to vector bundles of positive slope. And yeah. Okay, let me stop here. All right, maybe a few very quick questions. Ciao. How do you make sense of the dimension? Yes, you can make sense of the dimension. And so some of they, they have in some sense two dimensions. One is this kind of really algebraic dimension, which comes from how many copies of A1 there are. And then there's some kind of secondary dimension that you can also define, which counts how many QPs there are. In the vector space language, uh, the number of copies of A1, this is the degree. And uh, this is the degree of the vector or coherent sheaf, and the number of QP factors is. Well, then there's a degree and the rank, and there's some formulas that express these dimensions. When you get to the dimension of the there's the same dimension that you're. Somebody else will say that the automorphism must be. Yeah, yeah, right, yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, you somehow count how many A1s there are, and then this gives you the dimension. Okay, maybe one more question. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, curious about the dimensional of this part of the curve. So, so in the, in the up-bound the proposition, are you claiming like, it's a higher cohomology where all vanishes? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a curve, right? So it should have coherent cohomology should only go up to degree one. <clears throat> okay. And I should also say that, like here I was somewhat only considering the coherent sheaves on like a far from 10 curve over a geometric point, and there is some, in some sense the same works in families. So there is some kind of series of families of banach comet spaces. Um, and some similar results are true there. Okay, all good things are three. Final question. 
Yes, and um, maybe uh, can you say what happens if you take the i star of O c prime? C prime is it, c prime is a different one. Yeah, That's an excellent question. Yeah. So. Uh, we can now take uh, different untils. They would give us different points of far contemporary if you could give us Korean sheaves. So we get, well, we get something that's represented by taking the A1 and with a different until passing to the diamond. And then this theorem there, that some are, this is somehow fully faithful, that we don't lose anything by passing the global section, tells us that it's actually really a different diamond. Yeah? So if you take an A1 over C and over a different until C prime, then as diamonds, they are still different. They still somehow remember from which until they came. And I don't have any good geometric intuition about how to think about this, but yeah, that's, that's more true. Okay, so maybe the other questions will be saved for the Q&A. Let's uh, thank Peter again.